A demoniacal frenzy suddenly took him. He furiously bit and devoured the edges of his shield. He kept gulping down fiery coals. He snatched live embers in his mouth and let them pass down into his entrails. He rushed through the perils of crackling fires, and at last, when he had raved through every sort of madness, he turned his sword with raging hand against the heart of six champions. It is doubtful whether this madness came from thirst for battle or natural ferocity. This quote is taken from a poem written in the 13th century referencing a Viking warrior. Today, if you look up the definition of the word berserk, it means to be out of control with anger or excitement, wild or frenzied. The word we know today is inspired directly by a specific kind of Viking warrior, the berserker. I feel like I'm beating a dead horse when I say this, but not much is written about these legendary warriors. There are some epic poems, a couple sagas, and mostly accounts written about them by the people unlucky enough to be on the side opposing them in battle. There is also a lot of conflicting information and theories about the berserkers, so I'll mention most of them and leave it up to you to decide what you think is fact or fiction. For starters, let's clear up a common misconception. It's often believed that all Vikings were berserkers, when that is far from the truth. The title was given to a very specific type of warrior. I don't know if the trend is a bit noticeable, but I like to break down words and names so that we can all get a greater depth of understanding and hopefully be able to retain some of the things that you learn in this podcast. With that being said, the word berserker in Old Norse is written as B-E-R-S-E-R-K-R, pronounced berserker, meaning bearskin or bear coat. I'm only making this distinction because from roughly 1150 AD to 1500 AD, when Middle English was the form of English that was spoken, the word cirque meant shirt. So historians at the time made the mistake of thinking that berserker were named such because they were bare of cirque, which meant they went into battle without armor. While technically true, and we'll get into that more a little bit later, they still got the actual origins of the name wrong. Berserkers didn't all wear bear furs or coats. They could actually be a part of one of three animal cults. You have the berserkir, as mentioned before, who wore the pelts of bears. These people are said to have worshipped Thor, Tyr, or Odin. The Ulfethnar, who wore pelts of wolves and were devout worshippers of Odin. And the Svinfil king, who wore boar pelts and worshipped the goddess Freya. These warriors were believed to take on the powers and characteristics of the animal pelts that they wore. Outside of those differences, they all had basically the same purpose. So from here on out, I'm going to just refer to all of them under the blanket term berserker for sake of simplicity. A berserker was akin to a shaman or druid. A candidate for one of these warrior cults would start off as a normal man and undergo an initiation process where they would seek a symbolic death and rebirth, awakening the powers of the totem animal of whichever cult they belonged to. They would spend a period of time in the wilderness, living like their totem animal and learning its ways, surviving through hunting, gathering, and raiding the nearest towns. This was the first part of their initiation as they would continue to chip away at their own humanity. They would separate themselves from society and ultimately their morals and conscience. Their existence was assured by the law of the wild and survival of the fittest. The candidate ceased to be an ordinary human being and instead became an animalistic predator. By the end of their initiation, a candidate had the ability to induce a state of possession by his kindred beast, acquiring its strength fearlessness, and fury. We don't know much about the techniques used to induce this bloodthirsty trance, but we do know that fasting, exposure to extreme heat, and ceremonial weapon dances were some of the things involved. Not much is mentioned about the type of weapons training they would do, but they are noted as being ferocious in battle and very skilled in the art of war, with an ability to kill a man with a weapon or their bare hands with ease. Vikings often were equipped with a round shield, spear, bows, knives, swords, or the Danax. Because of the nature of a berserker, I doubt highly that they would ever use a bow and arrow, instead opting for the round shield and any other weapon of their choice to deliver a much more personal and gruesome death. Revisiting the mistranslation of their name, these men who were bare of cirque actually are said to have gone into battle with minimal clothing or armor. There are accounts of wolf coats going into battle naked, aside from the pelts of their totem animal, but a lot of prints, reliefs, carvings, or drawings show them at least wearing pants as well. 
The earlier sagas portrayed berserkers as bodyguards, elite soldiers, and champions of kings, but where they gained their true notoriety was when they were used as shock troops. Their nature made them ill-suited for standard battle tactics and formations, so they would often be used as an advanced assault force that would serve a double purpose of paving the way for the Viking armies behind them and to terrify, disrupt, and cause chaos among the enemy ranks. Because the Berserkers were devout followers of the gods, specifically Odin, sending them into battle first was also done in order to gain favor from Odin in their upcoming fight. Before a battle would start, these men would gather and begin to work themselves into a frenzy, frothing at the mouth, banging on their chest, biting and ripping chunks out of their shields, and experience a purpling in the face as rage took over them. They would be so consumed by battle lust that they would attack boulders, trees, and on some occasion even kill each other as they waited for the battle to begin. Once the battle started, these people operated on a near subconscious level, their vision red with bloodlust and their sense of pain dulled to an extreme degree. Since these warriors were the pelts of their totem animals, it would distinguish them as a berserker. This was more so for the safety of other vikings because once these men entered into this battle trance called Berserker Gang, they could no longer distinguish friend from foe and cut down anything in their path. It is said that they accomplished feats of strength that were impossible for a normal human and could endure life-threatening wounds without skipping a beat as they massacred the next opponent in front of them. It was common for Berserkers to toss aside their shields and weapons in battle. This was kind of a big deal because shields and weapons were often passed down as a type of family heirloom which recorded the battle history of their fathers and forefathers. So for a berserker to toss these things aside so easily, further signified that these were no longer men, but closer to the animals whose pelts that they wore. The pinnacle of a berserker's life was the hope and dream that they could one day truly become their totem animal, and some berserkers were so successful in battle that they are actually recorded in the sagas and poems as shape-shifting into monstrous animals in the middle of a battlefield. Once the battle was finished, these legendary warriors were said to have become enfeebled, unable to move, and would regularly pass out from the physical and mental exhaustion caused by the Berserker Gang's state of mind. In 1015 AD, Norway had officially outlawed berserkerism, if that's even a word. The legal codes of ancient Iceland specifically mentions berserkers, branding them as outlaws, and by the 12th century, berserkers in any organized force or military presence had virtually disappeared. Because of the mysteries surrounding these people and their practices, a lot of theories have popped up over the years concerning them, my favorite of which I'm going to call the psychedelic viking theory. In 1784, a priest named Odman started a theory that going berserk was a result of eating fly agaric mushrooms. That explanation gradually became more popular and remains so today. Odman based his hypothesis on reports about Siberian shamans but it's important to note that he never witnessed the effects of eating this type of mushroom personally. He's only heard secondhand and thirdhand accounts. White agaric mushrooms has also been suggested as a cause of the berserk fury, but it is extremely poisonous and would more than likely render someone unable to fight. Eating agaric mushrooms can lead to depression and make the user feel apathetic. In addition to its hallucinogenic effects, but berserkers weren't described as depressed and were in fact the complete opposite of apathetic. Poisoning with the fungus Claviceps purpurea has also been suggested. It contains a compound used to synthesize the hallucinogen LSD. Keep in mind that if mushrooms were such a key part of Viking culture, especially as it pertained to their mightiest warriors, you would think there would at least be some mention of them in the sagas or poems, which there isn't. The first mention of the use of mushrooms by Vikings appears in 1784 with Odman's theory, long after the Viking era. I'm personally of the belief that the trance that these men would enter was purely psychological and of their own accord. They believed that they would be taken over by the spirit of their totem animals and were blessed by Odin in battle. The mind is an extremely powerful weapon that can do amazing things. It's very possible that these men rewired their brains so that when they performed their berserker gang rituals, they would work themselves into a hysterical frenzy and give themselves a massive adrenaline rush before battle. The author of the book Achilles in Vietnam, Jonathan Shea says, if a soldier survives the berserk state, it imparts emotional deadness and vulnerability to explosive rage, to his psychology and permanent hyperarousal to his physiology, hallmarks of post-traumatic stress disorder in combat veterans. 
My clinical experience with Vietnam combat veterans prompts me to place the berserk state at the heart of their most severe psychological and psychophysiological injuries. He's basically saying that once someone survives a true berserk state of mind, a person is then more vulnerable to enter into that blood boiling anger. Berserkers were people who actively chased after and lived in that state of mind, making it easier and easier for them to enter into it. And before they were outlawed in the 12th century, they lived in a society and practiced a religion that more than encouraged it. Once the introduction of Christianity came into the picture, it's very easy to see why the practices of the berserkers became illegal and eventually disappeared altogether. Christians considered such rituals, acts, and behaviors as demonic and believed they would happen due to evil supernatural forces. This is backed by the fact that Christians would refer to the Vikings as heathen devils in their writings. Because these warriors would enter into a state where friend and foe didn't matter, and whatever little bit of humanity they did have left would be cast to the wayside, it was common for them to pillage, rape, and cause all forms of chaos in whatever village was lucky enough to host them that day, ultimately giving the Vikings a pretty bad reputation across Britain and may have even inspired the legend of the werewolf. Even though some aspects of the berserkers have likely been exaggerated, this cult of super warriors did in fact exist and more than left their mark on history. Well, I hope you learned something new and interesting today. Please like and share this podcast with your family, friends, or just anyone you think would be interested in it. Thank you for listening, and I hope you tune into the next one.